amazed sometimes by the the difference a day can make is what the old expression is that people used to say sleep on it you know they would there was a long actually it came from a long expression or long maybe even a sermon i'm not positive that i remember seeing the original context of where this expression came from but most colloquialisms or most expressions in america come from something that existed prior and then have been shortened slowly but surely and compressed into a real simple statement that a lot of times people use to teach or to instruct or to give common sense or uh, wives tales or ideas or idioms or quotations that were meant to be instructions and directions with which we would go and <laughs> thinking of whatever it was that I was starting to talk about as far as that idiom was concerned that the idea of sleeping on it came from the concept that each day would bring a new day and that it would change and that the expression was you never know what a new day may bring or what a new day may bring was from the idea that God makes all things new is that he is in a new day in the next day it could be perceived in a different way and that you might have better understanding and better comprehension because God has had an opportunity to work on you and to develop in you a idea or a reevaluation of the circumstances and the thing I like about that is that every day makes each day exciting because you're not just looking back or you're looking forward or you're looking at but God is always bringing to the forefront of your mind things to consider, to ponder, and to be aware of. Because you see, when we're told this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate on it, when thou risest up, when thou sittest down, when thou eatest, when thou drinkest, when thou art on the way, when thou art going down the street, it wasn't meant to be just simply a ritual idea of, you know, I'm going to, in my mind, write down these notes and keep these, you know, concepts that I have to keep floating around and, you know, keep working at and, you know, building at and making it into a ritual that I have to keep, you know, putting it on my forehead or putting it on my wrist or making it some kind of a spiritual interpretation. But God, if you would commit it to him, would bring to you, to your remembrance, those things that Jesus said. So you would consider them, that you would think about them. They wouldn't be a duty, it would be a understanding that he would bring as you allowed his circumstances that he's arranged in your life to add meaning to that which you are learning so on the one hand you could make it religious and get all worked up and you know memorize and drive the point home and become a religious pharisee because believe me when you come to orthodoxy if you sat down in an orthodox circle i mean believe me these men of god that are studying Torah, they really know the scriptures. I mean, there's no doubt about it. They have pounded, exerted, excised, and come up with unbelievable understanding. And yet, you could find the simplicity of knowing that God himself can bring you a better appreciation of his personal intervention in your life by giving you his Holy Spirit to bring to your mind, to cause you to bring to the forefront of your understanding that which he's speaking to you. So on the one hand, you could work at it, or on the other hand, you could let God do it. In Tozer, wrong desires pervert our moral judgments. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Matthew 5, 6. Unsanctified desire will stop the growth of any Christian life, and conversely, purified desires will tend towards righteousness by a kind of gentle moral gravitation. In the moral world, the right desires tend toward life and evil ones toward death. That in essence is the scriptural teaching on this subject. Whatever a man wants badly enough and persistently enough will determine the man's character. Wrong desire perverts the moral judgment so that we are unable to apprise the desired object of its real value. However, we try, still a thing looks morally better because we want it to. For that reason, our heart is often our worst counselor. 
For if it is filled with desire, it may give us bad advice. Pleading the purity of something that is in itself anything but pure, we can deceive ourselves. What our dominant desires are bad, the whole life is bad as a consequence. When the desires are good, the life comes up to the level of our desires, provided that we have within us the enabling of the Holy Spirit. As the root of all true spiritual growth is set of right and sanctified desires, the whole Bible teaches that we can have whatever we want badly enough if, it hardly need be said, our desire is according to the will of God. The desire after God and holiness is back of all real spirituality. And when that desire becomes dominant in the life, nothing can prevent us from having what we want. The longing cry of the God-hungry soul can only be, Oh, to be like you, God, to be like you, Jesus. In a fancy way of saying it, Tozer's come about the long way of saying that you can technically deceive yourself into thinking that the things that you want, because they're religious, are things that are right and righteous and beneficial to you, whereas the person of God and the holiness of God comes with the aspect of knowing God because he changes us and he's the author and finisher of our faith and he develops us to correct us from ungodly desires and temptations that plague us by renewing our mind as we read and we study the scriptures. So what Tozer is trying to say is if you make your desire the Lord, if you seek him as the countenance of what you want and always look towards that desire, then you will get what you want because he will meet you there. We're told that our heart is deceitful and wickedly made a perverse above all things because it's not just desire that mandates what we go after, but if you notice whatever you're consumed with or whatever you seem to spend the most time with winds up being what you desire to have in your life as you seek either the world and its ways, whether you seek passion, whether you seek self-satisfaction, whether you seek gratification, whether you seek to be somebody important or somebody humble. In a lot of ways, we can deceive ourselves religiously, but one way we can't is that if we make God the object of our desire, then his person, not his holiness, his person and knowing him in an intimate and personal way creates in us the absolute necessity of having conversation with him so he can lead us into right choices and change us to make us correct in our approach to him in all holiness, sanctification, redemption, and salvation. But that must be our desire because though you may say one thing have I desired, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If the house of the Lord is empty, you're in a temple without the spirit within. So be careful of your desires, that they are not the object, but the person of whom you're choosing. Because it is God that you desire. <laughs> because he's going to fulfill that desire in you.